I just think that it's really important, uh, and if you weren't here last week, I'll kind of bring you up to speed here on this, on what this means, you know, what this, the, the fact that we are a church that shouldn't be, what that means. And it's just, this thing that we have here is so wonderful, it's so special, um, and it's also so unique. I mean, when I look out and I see all the people that show up every Sunday, uh, I just, I'm amazed at it. I'm amazed that you guys pitch up. I'm amazed that you guys are here. But we are, and I don't ever want to forget this, we are the church that shouldn't be because none of what we have and are should be. And, and I even put it on a, a bracelet for you. Some of uh, you, if you pick that up on the way in, you can pick one up on the way out if you didn't get one. Uh, please don't grab more than one. After we pay off our debt, you can grab two. But in the meantime, <clears throat> we just want you to pay. We just want you to grab one. But I mean, when I think about this statement here, I think, I, I, you know, I think back to all the things that could have been the end of this church. And honestly, I think back to all the things that could have been the end of the church in general, the, the, the post-resurrection church that came out of, out of what Jesus did and the way and the following of the way. You know, none of what we have really should be. It just defies logic. I mean, how did, uh, for those of you that, that don't know me, how did a guy from East Tennessee end up quitting his job, uh, raising funds, moving to South Africa to Nelspray, of all places, meet his wife in White River, of all places, get married here, become a father of, of three kids, find our way from there to here in Cape Town, and end up leading you guys? I mean, that it shouldn't be. You couldn't write this stuff. We, we could not put all this down in a story if we even thought about it or tried to. And quite honestly... Part of this shouldn't be is, I mean, even myself, I, I shouldn't be, you know, but because how good God is, you know, he got me through a rough season, but we need to know that none of what we have in here, none of what we have in our here is because of us. Everything that we have and that we are here is because of God. And it's unexplainable as to why he has blessed us in the ways that he has. And in fact, I don't want what we do to start becoming explainable. I don't ever want to look at what God is doing in this house and with us and in our lives and begin to say, well, that makes sense. I understand that. You know, we have programs in place. We've got processes. We have leaders. We have teams. All that stuff is good and it's great. And that's the way that we can try and make church and church life uh, something that's good and safe and wonderful for everybody. But I don't want to look at the things that God is doing in here and look at the miracles and look at the answered prayers and look at the groups that are started and that are attended and, and see the smiling faces as they keep coming on Sunday morning, which is still just wild to me that you just keep showing up. And then some of you invite people. I mean, that's, it's just, it's, it's incredible. But I don't ever want that to be explainable. I don't want... At the end of this month, when we pay off two and a half million rand in debt because we're going through this Heart for the House campaign, I, that's not going to be explainable. I don't want that to be explainable. I want us to always be operating in the unexplainable to some extent. That's the part where we really throw our faith out there. You know, last week I asked you if you were here, I asked you to do something. If you weren't here, here's the question that I asked the church to think, uh, to think about and to consider. I want you, before you give anything to this campaign, which I'll, I'll explain in a little more detail here in just a second, I want you, and I wanted you, to ask God what it would cost of you. What, what is God asking of you? I, I wanted you to begin asking God that question. Say, God, what would you have me do for this house? God, what would you have my heart be for this house. And then we're going to jump to this week. Now, what I would like for us to do, and I would like for us to do what God says and then see what he does. So I've asked you last week, God, what would you have me to do? And I, I hope that God spoke to you. Maybe God didn't speak to you. Maybe he still is going to speak to you. Maybe you weren't here last week and you didn't ask him anything. You know, this week, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask again. But I want you to do what God says and then see what he does. You know, I, I gave last week, I gave an example. And I'll give it again this week. Um, 
It's, it's really the best example in my life where I've done what God said and then been able to see what, what he does. And it's about me and, and my wife, um, my wife, Casey, who's not here right now. She, uh, we only have childcare every other week, so she's here for the first service, and then she's with the monsters at home, you know. Uh, that's why I work late on Sundays, right? No, I'm kidding. Um, just making sure you guys are there. So with my wife, you know, I didn't, I didn't date Casey. Uh, we technically got engaged pulling into the Al Zoo on the way to Joburg, you know, the one with the rhinos and stuff. Uh, it's the best men's bathroom in the world. You can use the urinal and look out the window and see wildlife uh, right there. It's amazing. It's amazing. When we lived in Nelspruit, every time we drove back and forth to Joburg, you got to go to Al Zoo, best petrol station in the world. As we were pulling in there, I just looked at her and I said, hey, why don't we just get married in like a month? And, uh, and that was how that happened. But God spoke to me and God said, long before then, I didn't know her. I knew who she was. I avoided her. I didn't like her. had no feelings for her. Didn't want anything to do with her because she had this kid. She already had a kid. Uh, Letha at the time was seven. You know, they're just... No, thank you. And also, American women missionaries, are they come with baggage. They come with issues. Yeah, they do. They're like messed up. They're super messed up. You know, they come to Africa and, and they want or, you know, hey, you know, they come, they get their little child. You know, they're like, look at me. I'm saving the world. And I looked at Casey and I'm like, that, you, that's you. I'm not going to touch you with, you know, like a 10-foot pole. And God told me, he said, hey, Chris, are you ready to get married? I said, yes, I'm ready. He said, okay, I want you to marry Casey. And I remember a friend telling me, Chris, but you don't even like Casey, which I, I didn't. No feelings for her. And so I decided I was going to do what God says. And I sat down with, with her in our home a couple weeks after God told me that. And quite literally, we sat on opposite couches, and I'm just sweating, you know. And I'm thinking, this is my way out. That she's going to, if I go bold, she's going to say, never mind, like, get out of my house, right? And I tell her, I said, Casey, there's a lot about you I love. Or I didn't say that word. <laughs> Promise you that. <laughs> Promise that. I said, there's a lot about you that I, that I think is great. And there's a lot about you that's terrifying, but God has told me that you're the one that I'm supposed to marry. And I thought, got it. She's going to say, you're crazy. Get out of my house. She looks at me, doesn't even, doesn't even like think to consider. And she goes, okay, then I choose you too. And in that moment, I just thought, <sighs> yeah, even now when I think about it, I get heartburn. <laughs> You know, so in that moment, I realized I'm going to be a dad. I'm going to be a husband, you know, uh, but she said, yeah, I choose you too. Eight months later, we were married. Eight months later, one trip to Al Zoo, we got married. See, I, I did what God said. God told me and I did it. And then I got to see what he did. So when we do what God says, we get to see what he does. And I can tell you that the greatest blessing to ever come into my life, other than my salvation with God, is when I did what God said and he brought Casey into my life. She is the, the, the peace that I need. She's happy. She's joyful. We've got three kids. We have an amazing family. That woman is the only reason that I'm here, even walking around on this earth. Quite literally, Casey played a role in saving my life. I did what God said, and then I got to see what he did. I got to see what he does. And this is what I asked you about last week. Ask God what, this, what, what the cost for you would be. Ask God to put into your heart what you should do to help this house. What should your heart look like for the house? And now this week, next week, we get to see what God does. And I can promise you. God does amazing things. He's going to do an amazing thing. And so this week we're talking about, I told you guys we wouldn't do uh, a sermon on money. All right. I said, hey, hey, this isn't four weeks talking about money. 
Uh, so we're not talking about money today. It's involved. It is involved. Uh, but what we're going to be talking about today is generosity. Some of you may be thinking, uh, this is just Pastor Chris's clever way of covering money so that he can talk about money and ask about money. I just want to tell you up front uh, that you don't have to be nervous. You don't have to be scared. All right? If you invited somebody new and they came for the first time ever and you're like, oh, this is so great. It's a great church. We talk about amazing things. And then you're sitting there thinking, I'm going to murder that guy up there because I finally got a friend to come and we're talking about money, but really we're talking about, he says we're talking about generosity. I just relax, okay? Just deep breath and relax. Because even if you are not a Christ follower, whether it's your first time or your hundredth time uh, being here, this message today, is, it's going to help your life. It's going to help you. And here's why I can say that. Is when I thought about what happens at the end of the month. See, this month, uh, part of or the reason behind the heart for the house is that we're going to get out of debt this month. You like how confident I am in that? We're going to get out of debt this month. So that means that by the end of the month, we're going to give the bank two and a half, 2.55 million rand in, in debt. We're just going to give it to them. We're going to be debt free. And that's, that's going to come at the end of the month. I can just feel the air leave the room. You know, <laughs> I, could, I just feel it, you know. But come on, God. I mean, I, 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 mean I, I, I believe it. And the reason that I believe it is because God spoke it. God said to do it. So we're going to do it, and then we're going to see what he does. But we're not going to see what he does like, okay, maybe, hopefully, you know, uh, maybe over six months. No, no, no. God said get out of debt and get out of debt this month. I promise you I tried to get out of this, and God said no. And as we do that at the end of the month, what are we going to celebrate? Are we going to celebrate 2.55 million rand uh, that goes out there. And by the way, you know, if we, when we pay off that two and a half million rand, you know what that does to us here? Is that frees up 82,000 rand a month. That's 82,000 rand a month every single month that goes into ministry, into what we're doing here, that goes into projects that we want to do. It goes into kingdom building. It goes into all of that stuff. And that's why God has said to get out of debt so that we can then Go out and build the kingdom. And I, I know that when that happens, the thing that we as a church are going to celebrate is that we are an obedient and a generous church. Yeah, it will be great what we did. But to me, what's more important is that we asked God, we heard God, and then we did what he said, and then we watched God do what he was going to do. We were obedient and we were generous. And we're already obedient and generous. That's why God's calling us to do this. He's not calling us to really change. You guys are obedient and you are generous. So we're just playing on what God has already made us to be. So uh, before we move on, we just there's some things that we need to address about churches that are asking for money. All right. And if again, if this is your first time here, you're like, OK, let's let's get to the good stuff here. You know, if you're upset or you've been upset, you know, about the way a church has asked for money, I just, I first want to address something important. I want to address the elephant in the room, okay? The elephant in the room is that, yes, we're asking uh, or we're teaching about generosity, and through that generosity, yes, money is involved in that. And I, I believe that this is kind of a, a mess for people, that people don't like to hear this because... I think that this has been taught wrong in so many ways and, and over so much time. I think that it's been manipulated. I think it's been uh, misspoken. I, I think it's been mistaught. I think it's been used for the benefit of, you know, uh, of an idea or, or a burden or, or even just something that the pastor wants or the church wants to have. And, and that over time has given the church a reputation that honestly it actually probably deserves that money, a talk on money, is because they want more money. So the only reason we talk on finances is because we want more finances. Now that's not the case and that's not God's design for it, but there is a term for that. This is what I call that. I call that slot machine mentality. All right, so that means that when you put money in, you get money out. 
So, so if I were preaching this, I would, I would sit here and I would, God, you know, you got to give, you got to give. If you want your blessing, then you need to sow into this. Come on, if you don't give, if you don't put money in the slot machine, how are you going to win? Hey, if you don't put a coin in the slot, you're not, you can't pull the lever and see what comes out of it. Don't you want to see what God's going to do in your life? Don't you want to see how God could bless you? Don't you want to see how God could do a miracle in your life? Well, you got to sow into that. You know, that, that's, that's the way this normally goes. But that's not the way that God intended for it to go. And that's not the way that we're going to teach that generosity goes. Or that tithing or money, finances. That's not the way that works here in this house. You know, you put money in the slot machine, the house always wins. And the house is not, I'm not saying we always win. I'm saying you never win. And you live in uncertainty. And you just live in hopes. I hope I put it in and something comes out. So this is why we have a problem. This is why it's tough to talk about generosity, to talk about money in a church. And there's a couple other reasons. One reason comes from Jesus himself. All right, So Jesus, he had this, this thing that, that he would like to say. And one time, there's, there's a verse and we're going to read it. Uh, but, but Jesus says that it is better to give than it is to receive. And so I've got a, rep, a graphical, very accurate representation of this up here for you. So if you give, you smile. Yeah, happy. It's better to give. Receiving, you know, it's got a sad face there with a tear coming out of their eyes. And I, I just, you know, it's, this is easy to talk about and, and really just easy to, to preach, you know. Hey, it's better to give than it is to receive. Uh, I want to put this into practice this week. There's a joke coming, just so you don't get extra upset here. This week, I want you to all give me something. And then next week, we'll see who is happier, okay? See, okay, the joke is, is that I'm happier, all right? You know, the, the, the thing with it is, is that when we talk about it's better to give than to receive, we're, we're on the side of, yeah, but what about my house payment or my rent? What about the electricity that I need to load on the meter? What about the school fees? What about the clothes? What about the petrol? What about, you know, money for transport? What about my safety? It's better to give than it is to receive. But honestly, if I received a little bit more, I think I would be happier. So when we think about it like that, then I think we start to see Jesus in a different way. We start to see Jesus like, you know, like Pinocchio. Do we know who Pinocchio was? The wooden nose. And what happened when he lied? His nose grew. So Jesus tells us it's better to give than to receive. But you can't meet your basic needs. And so we look at Jesus and we say, I don't know, man. I think you're telling lies here. I don't believe it. And then... Not only did Jesus kind of throw us for a loop here, but Paul, he also is teaching. He's teaching about, you know, being generous. And he tells a church, which we're going to read today, what, you know, what kind of generosity, what kind of giving does God like? So now we're going to talk about Pinocchio Jesus. And Paul's like, what, what do you think that Pinocchio Jesus likes? And he says that God loves a cheerful giver. He likes when you're cheerful. Now, for us, we don't think about this when we write our tithe. We don't think about this when we uh, put that 10% into the, the offering box or on an EFT. We don't, we don't think about it like this. I think for us, it's easier to think about it as God loves a faithful or dutiful giver or tither or generous person. And it's great to be faithful. It is. I'm not saying that that's wrong at all. You should be faithful. You should be dutiful with your tithe, with what God's given you to steward. But God is saying that He also wants us to have a heart of generosity. He wants to have a cheerful heart in what we get to do. And I believe, again, if we talk about the struggle here, the struggle with generosity, the struggle with money, with finances, with tithing, with giving to a church, with a pastor asking the church for money, with this idea that uh, you know, how dare he ask us to pay two and a half million, you know, rand in a, in a month. That's just bananas. That's crazy. It's, it's not even appropriate for him to do that. Here's, here's why that, I think that that exists. Because there's a, there's a gap between us and Jesus. And this gap that's between us here, we sit on, on this left side here. 
And on our side, we see our needs. We see the impossibility of it. We see that something is beyond our capability or beyond our reach. We, we see that something is maybe is absurd. You know, we look around and we think, there's no way that that's going to happen. It's unexplainable, right? It's, 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 there's no way. Yeah, guess what? It shouldn't be because it shouldn't be possible. That's where we sit here. On this other side, Jesus, God sits there and says, you're right. It shouldn't be because none of what you have in ours should be. But on my side, here is what generosity is. Here's what generosity looks like. Here's what you can do with your generosity. But our challenge is, how do we jump the gap? How do we go from where we are to joining God's definition on it? Say, so even if you don't want to be generous, even if you don't want to give, if you don't want to tithe, if you don't want to do that, what I'm talking about here is like a mind shift. It's a, it's a heart change. Do you want to be this person over here that's just you know, bitter about finances and bitter about money, bitter about your own finances. Because whether you give or don't give, whether you're generous or not generous, if you jump the gap over here, you sit on the side with God, and with that comes a lot of peace, a lot of security. So I'm advocating for more than just generosity. I'm advocating for you being on the right side of what things mean and what things are. I'm advocating for us to jump the gap and be on God's side. So I hope that by the end of today... We're able to go from one side to the other. We're able to go from reluctancy to instead excitement and privilege. So when it comes to being generous as a generous church, I, I hope that we're able to move out of reluctancy and think, ah, I don't know. You know, Pastor Chris is asking me to think, what, what is this going to cost me? Uh, you know, I don't, there's nothing Actually, God, I've got no margin. That's easy. It's not going to cost me anything. And I want you to go from reluctancy to then instead this other side where, where God sits of excitement and even privilege. So I'm going to tell you about a church today that jumped this gap. They went from reluctancy to excitement and privilege. And this is a church, the, uh, this is a Macedonian church. And what's happening here is Paul needs to raise money for a church in Jerusalem. Paul never fundraised for himself, but he needed to raise some money for the church in Jerusalem. It was under dire need, under stress. There were things going on, and Paul had to do some fundraising. Now, he went to one church in a place called Macedonia, and the church is there. They were incredibly generous. And then he goes to the church in Corinth. And Corinth was a wealthy place. It was a wealthy city. It was a port city. It was probably one of the most important, influential cities around at the time. And Paul goes there, and he had planted a church there. And if you want to read about that, you can go to Acts chapter 18. And that's the story of Paul starting the church in Corinth. And then the church kind of gets a bit wayward, and he corrects them. And then he writes a letter, and then he writes another letter. And we're going to jump into this second letter here that Paul writes. And jump into some of the conversations that Paul is having with the, the church in Corinth. And this church that was founded was founded about 40 years after the death of Christ. So these people were there. These people were alive when Jesus resurrected. They, this is not 300 years later, 200 years later. This isn't based on oral tradition or human interpretation. This is people that were there present that saw it these are people that were alive while it happened people that heard the news when it happened and after it happened and so let's let's learn and hear a little bit about a church that was able to jump the gap so Paul sits down with the church in Corinth he'd written a letter and now you know some things were happening and he says you know what I just need to go I need to show up so Paul shows up and he says now brothers and sisters he's speaking to the church we want to tell you about the grace of God, which has been evident in the churches of Macedonia. So he's, church in Corinth, I want to tell you about this other, these other churches, this other group here. That's what Paul's saying. And what he's going to talk about with the churches in Macedonia is how God is awakening in them a longing to contribute. I, I don't know a lot of people that long to contribute or long to give, but Paul here is telling them, guys, there's a church in Macedonia and they are longing to contribute. 
Now, before I move on, I want to explain something about this text here and about these three letters down here at the bottom. This is a translation called the Amplified uh, Bible, the Amplified Translation. And what it's using is, if we get nerdy here for a moment, the NASB uh, translation, which is kind of the most word for word translation that there is. And then what the Amplified Bible does is it takes the NASB and it breaks down the context and the meaning of things. And so what it's doing here is it's saying here that he wants to tell you the grace of God which has been evident in the churches of Macedonia. Well, what is that grace of God that's been evident? You know, when you look at the context and you look at the the language that it was written in, well, the grace of God is that there's an awakening in them longing to contribute. Here's why this is important. I, I preach out of the Amplified all the time. And it's amazing. Other pastors are like, how do, you, how do you do this with your church? And I'm like, why do you give your church an option? You know, like, yeah, all right, just do it, you know, do it and they'll figure it out. And so I preach out of this all the time. But I want to highlight this today. I cannot manipulate this text for my benefit. I can't manipulate this text for the benefit of the church. I can't use this text to guilt you. I can't use this text to guide you. The text is what the text is. And with the amplified version here, it even gives the context and the meaning to the words. I can't make assumptions. I can't take it out of context. I want you to know that what we read today is the text. It's only the text. It's the word of God. It's only the word of God. There's no word of Chris that's in here. When we talk about transparency, this is as transparent as it gets. So, Let's move on here. So Paul has just told them about the church is having this awakening, you know, within them. And then he says, for during an ordeal of severe distress, this is the church in Jerusalem going through severe distress, their abundant joy and their deep poverty. Now, here's where the Amplified is great. Their abundant joy and their deep poverty together. Okay, It's not abundant joy with exception or deep poverty with, you know. They had together abundant joy and deep poverty. So while they were deeply impoverished, they were abundantly joyful. All right, that that, that already we've taken uh, the world's population and we've you know you know sunk it down. If I if I asked in this room who's abundantly joyful, some of you would raise your hand. And then if I asked who's deeply impoverished, some of you would raise your hand. Probably not a lot of people that are raising your hand for both. But this church did. And so he goes on to say, together, they had this overflow in the wealth of their lavish generosity. What a great sentence. Abundantly joyful, deeply impoverished, but wealth of their lavish generosity. They were a generous church. They'd made the jump across the gap. In verse 3, for I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave voluntarily. See, what I think is important here is, What Paul says first, for I testify that according to their ability. See, I'm not asking you to ignore the according to your ability. And I'm I'm not preaching to say, hey, you know what, just give beyond. Come on, everyone can give a little bit more. Everyone can sacrifice more. Everyone can be more sacrificial with your generosity. You know, go, don't, don't get hung up with what you have and what you can. Just look beyond that. that. That's not what it says here. What it says here is, first of all, they looked at, what, what, what they were able to do. Then after they considered what they were able to do, then they thought about giving beyond that ability. But that, that's, that's them making that decision in the same way I want us in our generosity to make that decision. But I don't want you to think that I'm just asking you to go beyond your ability. Actually, what I'm asking you throughout this whole thing is to hear God and then do what God says. So anyway, let's move on here. Um, so in verse 4, this is, this is wild that a church would do this here. I pray this prayer over you guys every Sunday, you know. And it's begging us. Paul says that the church of Macedonia is begging us incessantly for the privilege of participating in the service for the support of the saints in Jerusalem. So these people were actually begging Paul, can we be a part of helping the church in Jerusalem? 
Can we be a part of supporting them? What was Paul asking for in support? He was asking for financial aid. And they're saying, we're poor, we're impoverished, our ability may be small, but we can go beyond our ability. We're joyful about how we want to do it, and we are begging you to allow us to do this, allow us to be a part of it. And then in in verse 5, Paul goes on to talk about them. Not only did they give materially, so yeah, yeah, they gave. They gave financially, they gave stuff. And we had hoped for that. Not only did they give materially as we hoped, but here's, this, is, this is it, okay? This is what makes things different here. This is very important. Don't miss this. If you're mad about money already, stop being mad. You're going to miss something really good here. You're going to miss what my heart is and what the heart of the church is. You're going to miss what God's heart is. Paul says, not only did they give materially as we had hoped, but first, they gave themselves to the Lord. First, they gave themselves to God. That's why last week I asked you, hey, don't give anything yet. What you've got to do first is you've got to go to God. And you've got to say, God, what would you ask of me? That's you first giving yourself to God before you give yourself to anyone else. That's why I don't feel like I have to ask you for certain numbers or for certain things. All I need to do is ask us to be what we are, a generous and obedient church. And I believe that if I can get you to talk to God more, if I can get you to hear from God, and then you do what God says to do so that we can see what He does, then I believe that's you saying, okay, first I'm going to give myself to the Lord. I want to encourage you to first give yourself to God. And we're going to even do that at the end of this service. So he says, first they gave themselves to the Lord, and then to us as his representatives. Now, by the will of God, they disregarded their personal interests, and they were giving as much as they possibly could. I mean, this is a pretty amazing church, the church in Macedonia. And I, I believe that if we were to celebrate them, the things that we would celebrate would be their generous heart, and it would be the fact that they were obedient. They went to God, and they asked God, God, what do we do? And God said, here's what I want you to do, and they did it. And they did it, and then they watched what God would do. And they did it with joyful hearts. And it's just, it's, it's an amazing thing. And Paul uses that to encourage the church in Corinth, who had plenty of money, plenty of finances. He's like, guys, look at what these guys are doing. Now, if you could also have this generous heart. And so how did the church of Macedonia make the jump? How did they jump the gap and get onto God's side of understanding generosity? And how can we jump the gap and get on God's side of understanding generosity? And again, if you don't like talking about money and finances, if you don't like, you know, if you don't even like Jesus and you ended up here for, you know, some random reason or somebody, you know, convinced you to come or convinced you to be a part of this here, uh, both of the things that we're going to talk about now, are, they're, they're good things. And if you're a skeptic, that's great. Because everything I'm going to tell you, that I have told you and I will tell you, you can apply. And it's great. And it, and it t- reveals the heart of God to you. So let, let me tell you, I'm running out of time. I've got to hurry up here. So we're going to hurry through a couple of these because I want to get to, get to all of them. So the thing that they understood when they jumped the gap, the first thing they understood is that by our design... We are made to be generous. By our design, we're made to be generous. So we are made in the image of God. We are made in the likeness of God. And God is a generous God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He gave. He was generous. What did God tell Abraham? God told Abraham, I will give you descendants that will outnumber the stars. When Jesus gave of himself... That's pretty generous. Jesus sat in the garden and he asked God, is there any other way for me to do this? And he had blood coming in place of tears. And God said, no, there's no other way. And Jesus says, fine, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus generously gave for us. Jesus defeated death for us. See, this is the generosity of our creator. The generosity of Jesus, the generosity of God. And if we're made in his image, then we also are made to be generous. Paul describes this to the church in Corinth here in, verse, or in chapter 8, 
uh, here in verse 9. For you are recognizing, so he's telling the church in Corinth now. He's saying, hey church, you're recognizing more clearly. So you're, you're understanding it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the generosity is the grace. Jesus is graceful. He, he, he's given you something that you don't deserve, you know. So his astonishing kindness, his generosity, his gracious favor, that though he was rich, as he sat in heaven on the throne with God, Jesus was rich. Instead, even though he's rich, for your sake, for my sake, for our sake here, he became poor. He became a baby. He became, he, he could do nothing for himself. He became man, and he became man in a manger. And he became poor so that by his poverty, you might become rich and abundantly blessed. See, the root of our generosity is realizing who God is and how we are made in his likeness. That's the way this works. And I believe the church of Macedonia understood this here. That their design was to be generous because they were made in the image of God. And when you understand what God did for you, when you understand the explainable grace that God gave for you, He died on the cross for you. And if you're not a, hey, if you're not a Jesus person, what, what I'm saying here is that we believe that we were wrapped in sin and that we are doomed because of our sin. And this guy came down as a baby, grew up, did all these miracles and stuff. He left heaven and came down. Then he died so that we would have forgiveness for what we did. And by the way, he did none of the wrong things. And just understanding that and grasping what we can grasp of that and then realizing that we're made in the same image as that guy, then we should be generous. That, that's where our generosity comes from. And then now if we go to what Paul was saying about how God loves you know, a, a, a cheerful giver, and if we go to what Jesus was saying about how it's better to give than to receive, that it makes a bit more sense. Let's, let's look at Acts 20 here. Here's the verse. In everything I showed you by example, this is, again, Paul is talking to the church, that by working hard in this way, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. He's encouraging them here to, 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 to take care of those that are around them. And he says, remember the words of Jesus that he himself said. It's more blessed. And what, what's he mean by this word blessed? Thank you, Amplified. And it brings greater joy. It brings greater joy to give than to receive. It turns out Jesus is right because it's our design. Our design is to be a cheerful giver. Our design is to be generous. And when we operate in our design, that's where we find our fulfillment. You know, if you can kind of understand, let me explain this a different way. If you have a job that you don't love, it's very difficult to go to work and feel fulfilled at work. You maybe don't feel like you are operating in your purpose at your office or at your work environment. You kind of probably feel like, I, I hate this place. Why am I here? You know, but if you have a job that you love and that is suited to your designs, is suited to your characteristics, is suited to your strong points, to your passions, then going to work is amazing because you're operating in your design. You know, it, it means that, that, hey, if you love your job, you never work another day. Because you're operating in your purpose. You're operating in your design. The same thing applies to generosity. When we operate in our purpose and we operate in our design, that of a generous heart. And I'm not even talking about money here. Money's involved, but so is generous of love. So is generous of sacrifice. Generous of patience. Generous of care. Generous of time. When we operate in our generosity, we're operating in our design. And it feels great. And the second thing that I think help them jump the gap here is that they understood that generosity is our vocation. Here's what this means to us. This is for us here. Your vocation, it's your calling, your life's work, your mission, and your purpose. So generosity for us, it's our calling. Generosity for us is not optional. It's our life's work. It's what we're to be known for. That's why we celebrate that we are a generous church because that's what we are known for. Paul says the church of Macedonia is known for their generosity in spite of their poverty or any of those other you know, distractions that they have. 
They're known for their generosity. It's our mission and it's our purpose because we were created in the image of God to do these things. So to be generous is our vocation. And here's, here's what, what Paul explains this to the church in Corinth with this here and in, in the, this verse here in verse 11. He's trying to encourage them, trying to give them this, this piece of encouragement here. You will be enriched in every way so that you may be generous. And this generosity administered through us is producing thanksgiving to God from those who benefit. So I want to look quickly. I'm already over time, so I apologize for this here. Um, you will be enriched in every way. The way that this is normally taught is, is this. Is that God will give you if, you, if you sow in, if you put your coin in the slot machine, you're going to be enriched in every way. You're going to be enriched. You're going to be blessed. You're going to have everything that you need. Come on, if you be generous, if you be generous here, be generous. Pay off the two and a half million rand of debt for us. And guess what? I promise you, you're going to be enriched in every single way. That's a lie. I can't make that promise. And the Bible doesn't guarantee that promise in any way. There's two words that prevent this from becoming a prosperity gospel. These two words are the word so and the word that. You will be rich in every way so that. Now God is going to tell us our purpose for why we are enriched. We are only enriched for one reason and one reason only. It is so that you may be generous. And this generosity administered, meaning... You may be generous and you've got to do something with that generosity. And when you administer that generosity through us is producing thanksgiving to God for those who benefit. None of the rest of this verse here has anything to do with benefiting me. I am generous and I am enriched in every way so that the rest of this verse has everything to do with benefiting those that receive it. And I think that as the church understood that, they understood that as our vocation, we've got this, uh, we have an obligation. So God blesses us. Here's the, here's the path for this. God blesses us so that we can distribute God's things on God's behalf with God's purposes. Right? It's not for me. It's not for you. When you're generous, it's not for me. God blesses us so that we can distribute God's things. Everything you own is God's. He gave you everything. None of what you have has anything to do with you. God's provided it all. And when he gives it to you, it's so that you can distribute those things on God's behalf with God's purposes. See, here's God's desire for our, for our church here. God does not want to bring his generosity, his justice, his healing, his provision outside of us, outside of this church. What God is saying is I want to partner with you guys and Through the church, I want to bring these things. So what that means for us is that means that we've got to be stewards of what God provides. We've got to steward it. And when we steward what God provides, that's us saying, okay, you're giving it to me. Now, I know that it's not mine. I'm not holding it. I'm now giving it out. I'm now providing it. I'm taking what you've provided and giving it your way according to your will to be blessed and used the way that you want that to be done. Because I'm a good steward of that. I don't own it. You gave it to me. I'm stewarding it. I've got a slide. I want to skip a couple slides. Karina, let's skip this uh, next slide here. I want to put two things I want to put on the screen for you. Karina, go to the next slide for us here. Okay, there we go. This is, here's what I want to leave you with here. This is, this is, this is big. And this is probably going to be a statement for us for a long, long, long time. This is what stewardship is. My provision, stewarded, can be someone's prayer answered. Right? See, God wants to work through us in partnership with us. And the generosity that we are given a capacity to give is not for us. It's not so we benefit. It's so that... Our provision stewarded, God's provision stewarded can be someone else's prayer answered. This thing, since I I wrote this down this week, this has rattled me. It's rattled my head. Not in a bad way, in a great way. In a way that makes me hopeful and it makes me excited. That not only is God saying, I want you as a church to expand. 
I want you as a church to be generous. Here's what you can do with your generosity. You pay off this two and a half million rand of debt and it frees up 82,000 rand a month. What's bigger, the number eight or the number two? Obviously, eight's bigger. So two and a half million is nothing because we're going to get this huge amount of 82,000, right? That's not once a month. That's every month. That's next month, the next month, the next month, the next month, the next month. And what that does for me is that gets me excited because our provision that came from God, we can steward that because it can be someone else's prayer that's answered. That's what God's calling this church to be. I, I want to do one thing with us. Uh, I want us to go through kind of like an exercise to practice generosity, okay? Again, let me just tell you, um, this, this has everything to do with you hearing from God. It has to be that. That's why now we're on week two, and I haven't said, now I'm ready for you to give. That's why on week two, I've not given you uh, even like a code for what to put on your EFT to give. Because I, I want to spend two weeks trying to get you to understand or trying to get you to go to God. That's what I want. That's what this is about. That's what this practice is about, what this exercise is about here. So I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes. I, I just want to put us in a, in a bit of a prayerful spirit here. So I'm going to ask you guys to do something. Um, I, want, I just want everybody, while your head's bowed and your eyes are closed, to just take a big, deep breath in. So you're just going to deep breath in, deep breath out. Deep breath in and deep breath out. And then in this moment, I just want you to ask God for a number. God, give me an amount. And then whatever number first comes into your mind, that's what you're going to practice with. Whether it's one rand, ten rand, whatever it is. You're going to practice with that number. And what I want you to ask God, now that you have that number in your mind, whatever it is, I want you to say, God, am I able to do this cheerfully? And if I'm not, help me learn to trust you more. Am I able to do it cheerfully? Am I able to give to you cheerfully? And then I want you to ask God how you can give and be more cheerful. Let him talk to you about that. And then what I would ask you to do is just t take a small step towards trusting him and trusting him with what he's given for you. So Heavenly Father, I join them in prayer and I pray, Lord, that you would call everybody to you that needs to hear from you. I pray, Father, that that you would that you would speak to everybody in this room you would put a number on everyone's heart and then you would give everybody the ability or the burden to trust you lord we love you and we thank you for how generous you are for us we pray this in your lovely and wonderful amazing name jesus amen